his career uh, includes both academic uh, uh, work and industrial uh, work. He was professor of um, pharmaceutical chemistry at the University of uh, Innsbruck. And uh, then in 2003, founded uh, the company Intelligent, and he served as CEO between 2003 and 2008. And uh, he was appointed CEO of uh, Presswick Chemical, uh, a contract research organization in uh, uh, medicinal chemistry services. And since 2013, he's uh, a full professor of pharmaceutical chemistry at the University of uh, Vienna. And uh, today we will talk about approaches to next generation pharmacophore modeling. We look forward to your Thank you, dear Joao. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. First of all, I really want to thank uh, Alexandre and his team, Fanny, uh, Olga, I don't know where she is, for really setting up this summer school. It's amazing, it's great, it's a perfect time to uh, network, so please take advantage of this. It's really great to have it. But Sasha, not only for the summer schools that you have organized, but also for your continuous effort in teaching cheminformatics and setting up master programs, international master programs. This is so important uh, to have this. And uh, really, um, I guess some of the people that here uh, come out of these master programs, I had a few already in my group as PhD students, it's a fantastic thing to have this. So thank you very much. So today I will speak about um, approaches to next generation pharmacophore modeling. And I really believe uh, that there is next generation pharmacophores out there. We are constantly working on that. And I will probably run out of time at the end. So I want to acknowledge people in uh, my groups, both when I started this whole work at the University of Innsbruck, then as, as uh, Joao said, I moved away um, and at the University of Vienna, some people that I really want to mention here, Thomas Seidel, Stefan Kohlbacher, Markus Wieder, Oliver Wieder, and at the company, Intelligent, that we founded almost 20 years ago, where I really have to thank Gerhard Wolber, Gerkan Ibis, Fabian Bendix, but especially also Sharon Bryant, who is heading the company since many years and makes it really successful. So uh, yesterday there was the discussion about molecular similarity. And um, I don't know how many people of you know this guy here. Not, not, please, not the <laughs> among the young ones. Do you know this person? This is probably one of the most influential guys in QSAR uh, and, and computer aided molecular design. It's Hugo Kubini, who I had the chance to visit uh, yesterday, uh, the day before yesterday, and to talk for a few hours with him. And he had a very nice article among a lot of articles about molecular similarity uh, from a medicinal chemist's point of view. So there is no real clear definition about what is similar and what is dissimilar because it always depends who looks at something to see a similarity. And he writes here, however, chemical similarity may have different facets if a computer chemist or a medicinal chemist look at this uh, term. So there is a great resource for you guys. Visit the website of Hugo Kubini and download some of his lectures. I just show a few images here from this lecture that he gave many years ago about chemical similarity and biological activities. And uh, read this and have this in mind. Uh, it's really uh, a sort of condensed knowledge here that he presents. And there's a few slides that I want to show you from this lecture that he gave uh, about molecules. And some of these molecules might look very similar to you, but in reality, they are completely different. They have same shape, molecular volumes and surface, but on the surface, there are already other uh, properties that you can look. When you look at hydrophobic and polar regions, they look similar for six out of the eight, but completely different for two out of the eight. When you look at hydrogen bond donor potentials, there are some that are similar, some are very different. Hydrogen bond acceptor potentials, the same thing. And when you look at molecular electrostatic potentials that you can express as, as these molecular um, MEPs, 
you can see that they are more or less, most of them completely different, even if the scaffolds are pretty similar. So there is a big danger when you look only at scaffolds and don't take into consideration the properties of the atoms behind. So a possible solution uh, is to look at compounds and look at compound structures in the view of their preferences for specific molecular interactions. What we look is at how molecules interact with each other. Normally we look at small molecules interacting with a protein. So what you could do is here annotate molecule, molecules with all interaction features possible. So this would be something where you say, okay, this group can make a heterophobic interaction, aromatic interactions, uh, positive ionizable, negative ionizable, etc. So we come already to the pharmacophore concept, but is all, are all these interactions necessary so that a certain molecule can interact well with the biological target? No, the question is to find out which are them that are really the important ones, right? So a possible way to find the important interactions are to look at the interactions in a protein binding site. So when you can do this, you can just remove all the interactions that are theoretically possible to them that are really done in the binding interface. And this is basically a structure-based pharmacophore that we can generate here. This is a method that we uh, developed, not the pharmacophore concept itself, but the method to, de to derive on a click of a button uh, an interaction model between a protein and a ligand. Uh, was developed in, in this software. This pharmacophore concept is something that is really old. And here I, I show the, the, the definition, the UPAC definition of what a pharmacophore is that was uh, coined by Camille Wermuth, who was a very famous medicinal chemist here in Strasbourg. So the people in Strasbourg know him very well. And, and we have brought this uh, to, a, to a kind of next level by in adding much more interaction possibilities than in classical uh, pharmacophore modeling, like not only the electrostatic interaction, the age bonding, the aromatic interaction, the hydrophobic regions, but also coordination to metal ions, for instance, or even encoding for halogen bonds, you know, this kind of special thing that have been so many times an enigma for medicinal chemists that did not understand why all of a sudden when you exchange a methyl group by chlorine or bromine, you get a, a 10 to 100 fold higher affinity. And this is due to this halogen bond. So I really believe that pharmacophore models are the most suitable data representations, methods for guiding medicinal chemistry. Medicinal chemist thinks already in a pharmacophore, even if he doesn't know that he or she thinks in a pharmacophore way. So the question is, how to rank these pharmacophore features. And there are ways to do this. You can, when you don't have a, a structure available of your target, you can do ligand-based modeling and you can uh, make quantitative differences. Uh, the use of data in, in uh, binding, uh, you can encode into ligand-based pharmacophore models, into quantitative ones. We have just published a new method to do this. You can also do uh, structure-based modeling where you, as I showed you before, look at the features that are present in a binding site. You can try to understand ranking these features according to a delta between an optimal geometry that the feature would have and the feature that you can observe in the binding site. You can look at the environment. Is this something that is favorable there and tropically or enthalpically on disfavored? And you can analyze MD simulations actually uh, and the kinetics of bindings and encode this into pharmacophores. And I will show you this a little bit later. But first, let me just show you a first example here of this next generation modeling, where we used machine learning methods to uh, rank a multiple of uh, merged pharmacophore models that we generate in ligand, in, in ligand scout uh, with machine learning, uh, with a lot of cross-validation, then to get a, a novel quantitative pharmacophore description methodology. Uh, which just has been published. So you don't need to take notes. Anybody who wants the slides can have them afterwards. Just uh, drop me an email. Um, and this thing here in molecular dynamics, this is really something that now we, we uh, embrace. Uh, we believe that MD simulations have gained substantial impact even in industry because uh, the, uh, the computer time is available, methods are available that allow to, get, to generate these MD trajectories in a reasonable amount of time. The question is still, 
how to interpret the results in a perspective of a medicinal chemist. So this is just the article here that I want to show you. So what we set up is a sort of way to transform MD trajectories into a, a series of pharmacophore models. So we started the X-ray structure, of course, and set up an MD simulation uh, with classical methods. You can use whatever engine that is out there, Gromax, Amber, you name it. Then you store all your frames, and for all the frames, you generate the pharmacophore models. And this is a sort of, of image here, a, a, little bit new, a movie that I show you, uh, a ligand uh, that is binding to HSP90. And what you see here are features that are appearing and disappearing during the trajectory. So this is already telling us something that not all the features have the same importance. Obviously, some of them can be not there in a certain frame, and some of them will be there all the time. And so what we did is we, we created a way where we can look at feature frequencies. This is a sort of diagram on the left side here, where we bin the frames in, into units of several frames and then do the average, averaging and, and, and have a frequency uh, from 100% to zero. So if a, if a feature is there all the time in this bin, then it will be high. And you see these different uh, lines here. So you see here the hydrophobic features are there almost all the time, donors are there all the time, some acceptors disappear for a while, then come back, disappear. So you can already get an idea about the weights of these specific features. Next thing that you can do is then you can look at unique pharmacophores. So you can bin these pharmacophores together, all pharmacophores that have the same features in the same geometrical uh, arrangement with some tolerance will have, will, can be binned into this kind of, of uh, diagrams here, and you can look at them and find out which pharmacophores occur in which time. You can also look at the uh, amino acids that are involved in specific pharmacophore interactions. You know, when you look at hydrogen bonds, for instance, a hydrogen bond might be invisible for you if you measure the wrong distance. If a hydrogen bond moves from one residue to another one, same atom in the ligand, but different atom in the protein, you will lose it when you look at the distance only. If you look at the pharmacophore feature, you will see it because the feature is always there. So this is the big difference. So we believe that analyzing these molecular dynamics trajectories, finding relevant pharmacophore models is really defining a way to calculate similarities, to sample and identify rare, rare events sometimes, but that are important, and is a, is a really good way to abstract ligand protein interactions. So really, we believe in this. And we continue to uh, develop here in this way um, that we can uh, put a little more of um, uh, characterization of pharmacophore space in this procedure by not even having the necessity to have a ligand there. Because you know, in MD simulations, sometimes pockets emerge, but not necessarily because there's a ligand, but maybe because a ligand pushed somewhere else and then a new pocket comes up. And this pocket might be something that is very interesting because it might be druggable. So we want to have a method where we can monitor a whole binding site in an MD trajectory and characterize these binding sites according to pharmacophore features. So this is the way we do it. We create a, a grid uh, on these things. We perform grid calculations with buriedness uh, and interaction probabilities. We align these grids to have them in the same coordinate space, and then we can visualize and analyze this data. And looking for emerging, finding pockets, finding hotspots for potential ligand protein interactions, and evaluate binding, also evaluate binding contribution of specific water molecules. So there are methods that uh, are very expensive to, to determine uh, water interactions. Yeah? Uh, probably you know these this methods. Um, this one is a pretty uh, inexpensive one. And um, actually, we made this available on GitHub. So you can download this in this uh, chemical data processing kit um, that uh, Thomas Seil is working on. And, and this is the paper where we describe this uh, GRAIL, grids of pharmacophore interaction fields. Um, again, here is the, um, the workflow. I don't want to go too much into the details. The only thing that I want to mention is here uh, that uh, the interesting thing is we can 
uh, look at specific regions of interest. We can define these regions by selecting several key residues that should be in this box. And then we don't look at the entire protein, but we look at the specific binding box in this protein. In this case, in this HSP90, where I will show you a few examples, uh, we, we uh, focused on these residues here that, that are listed, and, and you see the box is more or less uh, here defer, defined by this uh, pink uh, kind of colored ribbon here, and here you have the ligand. And what we do is we then can select some of these residues as key points to align them, to align the boxes to each other. Because during a dynamics, everything is moving, the whole system is turning, sometimes translating, turning. And if we want to get consistent results in the grids that we can interpret afterwards by contouring some regions, we need to align the grids to each other. So we do this on specific residues that we know are important. And then we do a pairwise feature interaction scoring where we look at each grid point about the probability of this grid point being an interaction partner for the protein. Of course, there are some grid points that are in the protein, so we have to eliminate them. Of course, we do this. But what we get at the end and what we use as a scoring function is a so-called generalized Bell function. Here we tried different functions. We tried Gaussians. Uh, they were not uh, broad enough, I would say, the, the general Nice bell function was the best one. It's, it's pretty steep at the beginning, then it's around flat here, and then it goes again. And we can, uh, by setting uh, the slope uh, parameters, we can define how broad it is. And at the end, it, this whole thing results in, in a vector of scores for each of these grid points. So for the atom densities, we calculate them both for the protein if a ligand is there for the ligand, but this is not necessary. Actually, we don't need a ligand. Normally, in MD simulations, we have ligands to push for new pockets, but it's not necessary. You can also run these simulations without a ligand. And for water, and water is very interesting in this case, because each water molecule that is there is in a certain environment. And this environment can be favorable for water or disfavorable. It will be favorable if there are polar interactions and these water molecules will be not happy if the water molecule is in a hydrophobic environment. And these water molecules we would like to push out, but we don't want to push out water molecules that are happy because then the entropic cost would be way too high. So this is the way to define these different things. And then we can, uh, after we do these things, we can look at the different frames and, and contour these areas in the grid with different um, interaction probabilities. And when we put this now here, we have the, the simulation with the ligand, but the ligand has not been taken into account for generating these interaction fields. The interaction fields are just purely the ones derived from the protein. And what you can see here is this aromatic ring that is sticking exactly in, close to the region where it should have aromatic aromatic interactions where it should have hydrophobic interaction and where it can have a positive charge to aromatic interaction. So we have several kinds of things that we can uh, look at in the pharmacophore space, pi pi interaction, hydrophobic interactions, p cation interactions. Another uh, residue here, for instance, this lies in 100. You see it has negative positive charge here. Uh, it has a uh, H1 donor, H1 acceptor, and in D it has negative positive charge. So sorry, there is a mistake here. There should be D instead of E. And the last one that I show you is uh, the residue aspartate 85, where you see the regions that are uh, hydrogen bond donor to acceptor and hydrophobic to hydrophobic. So this is, these were pictures now from a static image, right, from one of the frames. But of course you can do this uh, in the whole dynamics. And I will show you a, a short video now for uh, water molecules. You can look for emerging binding pockets. You can find hotspots for interactions and evaluate water molecules. And when you look at water molecules, now this is the ligand here in the protein. And you can look at uh, water molecules that are entropically, entropically disfavored. These are what we call unhappy water molecules. Yes, they are in regions 
where they don't want to be because it's mostly hydrophobic. But then there are water molecules that are entropically favored or entropically favored even because they are in a polar environment. And these are these ones here, these guys. So these are all the regions where water is happy. And now when we look at the ligand, there is a region here where there is a very happy water sitting. So this indicates us that this doesn't go away. It stays there, it's always happy. So this is a region where we don't want to touch things. So this is the idea behind. It really shows you where you want to replace water molecules and where you must not replace water molecules. And then what I show here is how well uh, different um, ligands that we have fit into this exact region here where they should have interactions. And this is taken out of, uh, of a PhD thesis of uh, Doris Schütz, who did her PhD uh, with my colleague Gerhard Ecker in a, in a um, uh, European uh, community project, K4DD, where they looked at, uh, at residence times of ligands uh, and, and, and used MD simulations to rationalize these kind of things. Then Doris moved to Intelligent uh, before moving to Canada. <laughs> unfortunately, and, and the, we did this work together with her here to use this uh, data to rationalize it and, and to transform this into pharmacophore uh, features. So we really believe that this method can be used in, in a lead optimization to easily understand uh, design guidance actually to focus on specific regions where we can replace uh, and tropically disfavored water with small hydrophobic substituents, which is this typically magic methyl effect that you want to have. Uh, and, and we can use this pharmacophore hotspot frequency analysis for prioritizing replacement modification of molecular structures. Uh, and uh, this is also easily adaptable, of course, for automatization in the novo design. So we are currently working also on these kind of things. But I want to show you a few uh, other things, a few more things that uh, we have done here uh, to understand the relationship between these pharmacophores in the different frames to each other. Uh, we have developed a method uh, that we call hierarchical pharmacophore graph representation. So where we can, we take again these pharmacophores that are derived from the molecular dynamics trajectory, convert them in, in vectors and compare the vectors then to each other. Uh, and see how they are related to each other. Let me explain very quickly. So what we do is we, we bin the pharmacophores into, into a feature vector, into a pharmacophore feature vector actually, where we put in numbers, one if there is a feature there at the moment, or zero if there is no feature. And, and then we can see which are unique pharmacophores and which are pharmacophores that occur more frequently. So for instance, C and D are the same, so we can erase one and say, okay, this belongs to the same um, and, and move this up. So we then uh, end up also with the E pharmacophore is the same as the B pharmacophore. So we are at the end, we just have a reduced number. So then the question is, how are these linked to each other? What are the hierarchical links between these models? So we see B can be converted to C by adding one feature and C can be converted to A by removing a feature. So you see the bins here and, and how they are related. But how can we transform A to B? So A to B obviously doesn't exist because otherwise we would have found it. But we can calculate it. This is the good thing. So we can calculate a model uh, D that is a hypothetical model that, that is linking A and B together. In this way, we can create a whole tree. And then we can do Manhattan distance uh, calculations, uh, like a distance matrix, because it's now complete. And we can really go through and project the, the, this thing on a, on a vector where in the x axis, in the y axis, for instance, now we have the distance uh, of, of the pharmacophore vectors to each other. How do we come now from a pharmacophore model to a vector to a node? What is the relation here? And we can do this again, what I showed you, we can uh, create uh, a sort of quantitative information into the nodes by adding several models into one node. So a node that contains several models because it's 
appears more frequently will be bigger than a node that has only one model. And so what we can do is now we can uh, ha we have this information. We can project the distance between the pharmacophores if they are existing or even if they are not existing. So we see that, for instance, B and D are close to each other, D and C are close to each other, but C and A are closer to each other, closer than A and D. But you see the ones who are, who are hypothetical, you see the ones who are frequent, and you see the ones who are uh, not so frequent, so with the size of, the, of, the, of this blob. The next thing that we can do is we can also encode in such a diagram the number of nodes the number of features in a vector, in, in this pharmacophore vector. And this we can put then, we can plot this on the y, on the x-axis. So here we have the number of features. And now you can see here D has three features, B has four features, A has five features, and C has six features. And we still have the relationships between them and their distances. And now we can put this into a, into a, a tree that we can traverse. So actually we have here now the number of features on the x-axis again, and the number of pharmacophores. So you see here this one, for instance, with this would be one feature, two features, three features, four features, five features. This is the one that is occurring really frequently in the dynamics. This is the one also that is occurring very frequently, and you see how they are related to each other. So can you go directly from this one to this one? Yes, there, there are no direct connections, but you can, you see here actually how they are connected to each other. And this would be the most selective ones because they have the highest number of features, but which are, is connected. So this, for instance, is connected to this feature, and this again is connected to this model. So the way is, now, now we have a very uh, clear picture of the entire molecular dynamics trajectory in the pharmacophore dimension. And we can use now all these pharmacophores to do virtual screening. And we can do a, a quality matrix on this. We can, for instance, calculate uh, the AOC values. And, and uh, AOC of one, you know, is a perfect kind of match. Uh, and, and here we can color code now all these, uh, these points. Unfortunately, for the little ones, it's very difficult to see on this slide. You need to zoom in. But what you can see is here that uh, this one obviously has the higher score, whereas this one already has a little bit of a lower score in the AUC. So when you would like to select a, field, a pharmacophore for virtual screening for HIT ID, you would go with this one. So this would be the best one because it has the highest uh, AUC under the curve. We can also do pharmacophore clustering, look at uh, uh, do they belong really to the same cluster? And we see here that the, the, these two most frequent belong to different clusters here. So this would be one cluster in blue, the other cluster would be in, in light pink, etc. So this gives us a sort of overview on, on, on this um, trajectory in, in pharmacophore space. And this is a pretty complex uh, method here and, and a, a little bit cladded, I would say. And you have a lot of, of features in these vectors. Uh, you can, because here we have as partners both the ligand atoms and the protein atoms. So each atom on, an, on the amino acid that makes the interactions is encoded in the feature description. But we can also make a simplification of these trees by just taking the ligand atoms and the protein residue names. So only say, okay, this ligand atom makes and interactions to amino acid XYZ, for instance, right? So then it's not, it, not this carbon atom or not this nitrogen atom, but it's the amino acid. So the number of nodes becomes drastically smaller here. And again, you see these, these were the two biggest ones, but now the tree is much more interpretable. And also the number of features that you have in your vector is much, slow, much slower. So this would be the total a number of interactions that you could have in theory and how they are related to each other. So we did this in a collaboration uh, project um, with Laboratoire Servier here, and we had a case study where they were very interested in, um, in looking at um, uh, ligands of human glycokinase. And this is an overlay of two uh, MD trajectories. So the same uh, kinase with two different ligands and what we can we can overlay this, of course, because we get rid of all the uh, 
the protein information behind it just keep the pharmacophores with their notations. Now we can overlay several trajectories on top of each other and analyze this in this way. And what we can see is clearly define different binding modes in different pharmacophore descriptions. And you see how they are related to, the, to a sort of core pharmacophore that, that contains like the, the, the crucial features, but then divides this into two binding modes and analyze and really see what features you need to get in one binding mode for a specific activation or a deactivation of the kinase. So this is really an interesting thing here to get this information. So let me conclude with a few words here before I show you one last application. So we really believe that our pattern recognition based pharmacophore technique is superior to all other methods in this field. It's not something we did not invent pharmacophores, but we brought them really to a, to a level where it can be used um, in, in, in very, very, uh, I would say, efficiently for hit ID. This uh, concept now transformed into dynamic, uh, into the dynamic approach helps, sorry, uh, helps to um, you do the same thing in lead optimization. So this is very useful in lead optimization, but we can also use pharmacophores in another way to predict risks for Toxicity, and I'm very happy about the lecture yesterday. Um, we have a project here where we try to um, predict uh, neurotoxicity of molecules. And unfortunately, a lot of drugs have neurotoxic outcomes. There's always a, a molecular initiating event for that, but sometimes it's not yet completely understood. So there is this project, NeuroDerisk. You're welcome to look at this. Uh, this is an IMI project that focuses on the risking compounds, not only drugs, but especially drug candidates for uh, neurotoxic outcomes. And when we do this, we can do both ways. We can go into a target-based approach where we know exactly what is the target that must not be hit by a compound, otherwise it will elicit an adverse effect. But we have also uh, effects that we don't know why there is this effect. And for instance, one is suicidal ideation, uh, where we not clearly have an idea why certain drugs really would make you commit suicide. Now we start to understand also the biochemical background of this. It's very interesting. But of course, there are two ways we can do this. We can do structure-based modeling for the things where we have a clear target, and we can do ligand-based modeling where we know there are some ligands that have this outcome, but we don't yet understand the target. So this is what we did. I show you a few examples here. Uh, so for GABA A, which is a target that is heavily involved in uh, in seizure risk, so we have models that are based on on agonist binding sites, on on some uh, specific binding sites like the picucoline uh, antagonist binding site, the picrotoxin blocking site. So this is very straightforward. We can generate these models from CREAM structures, even refine them a little bit with dynamics, etc. The question is, now for more, more complex cases like suicidal ideation or mood disorders, can we really uh, find targets for that? Well, this is really difficult and, and Sharon and colleagues here did really outstanding job in, in uh, big data uh, analysis in looking at pharmavigilance data uh, different databases like FAERS, META, ADCB, NIH databases, etc. And then they created pharmacophore models, clustered these models, analyzed them with, with controlled data sets, etc., etc., and then had uh, from a company that is in the consortium, uh, ICDIAC in, in Montpellier, a company that has developed biomarkers for suicidal ideation. So they have now a number of drugs that they really know this drug has this signature that will drive you into suicide if you continue to take it. This is really for personalized medicine also because not everybody reacts to that, but it's very interesting and we had access to this database and we could fine tune our models for that. So we have now uh, models for something like 30 pharmacophore models so far in this um, neuro risk uh, database. Uh, for uh, seizure, for peripheral neuropathies, for suicidal ideation. And this whole thing is built into a, a profiler that we deployed 
in the nine environment here. So you can go to this website here, the new Adobe Skin Silico toolbox. What you have is you have a nine workflow actually where you um, can draw your molecules or you can input your molecules as smiles or SDF or any format XLS. Uh, and then there is the, the profiler node here. And in this profiler node, there is in, in built in all the ligand scout technology for conformer generation, alignment to the pharmacophores. The pharmacophores are there. They have access to the database of the pharmacophores. And then you can get this kind of profile here where you see the risk of your compound to hit a certain target or a certain adverse outcome. And then save it and, and, um, uh, and communicate it to your uh, colleagues. So with this, I just want to finish here. So I'm very proud actually about, uh, about these achievements here that we did with, with Ligand Scout um, that has been used in so many different ways. And I just heard a completely new one by Hanoch. Uh, so there's more than 2,600 papers out there uh, in all different uh, fields of structure-based modeling, ligand-based modeling, virtual screening, from hit ID to fragment-based design lead optimization, protein-protein interactions, drug repurposing, profiling, and also photovoltaic pharmacophores. So this is really great. So I, I want to thank you for your attention. And if you want to have a look at our websites here, you can go to the website of University of Vienna, of Intelligent, and of the NeuroDay Risk Project. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you for the very interesting lecture. I think we still have time for a couple of quick questions. There are yeah. two questions. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Well, first of all, I'd like to really applaud your efforts. This is really, I would say, elite league drug discovery tools. Because your idea basically is now taking the difference between two pharmacophores and you put that in vectors. And that opens new possibilities like agonist versus antagonist mutants, selectivity, machine learning. Oh, well, you start docking into that and that's your docking machine learning base. So my question is not really a question, your advice, how would you compare taking dynamic pharmacophore difference for virtual screening versus taking two snapshots for docking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is very interesting and we, we are currently investigating this. So what we found out is that um, it's not necessarily the, the most frequent pharmacophores that are the ones that are the best ones. So we did, we came up with, a, with an approach that we called common hits approach. We published this also. We take a sort of a collection of several models. We screen all the, 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 the molecules and then we re-rank them according to how many times they have been picked up by different pharmacophores. Uh, and what we, we can, of course, do this kind of uh, tree analysis also with docking, docking uh, scores and docking poses, of course. Uh, this is one of the ideas that we are currently also pursuing. Um, I think that this method is, is really also amenable, especially the algorithm that we developed for, for large scaling. So I know some companies uh, use uh, the, the legal scout pharmacophore on the cloud. So we have deployed also something where we can run this on, on Amazon instances, for instance, and they, they run routinely 100 million compounds through these models and get screening results within, I would say, half an hour or so. So it's really fast. Uh, in the docking, it is feasible. And we are currently working on that. And I don't know yet what the outcome will be, but it's very interesting, of course. And I completely <laughs> agree with you. <laughs> yes, there's another question. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for the interesting talk. I'm as excited about it as my supervisor here. Um, so we're, my work is quite relevant to what you're doing, and I was wondering, have you ever considered running molecular dynamic simulations of complexes, like let's say protein DNA complexes, and learning about the interactions of DNA and proteins to develop mm -hmm. 
molecules that will like mimic especially the for antivirals for instance yeah <laughs> what do you think about yeah. it no we did not we did not I, I must honestly say that we are not really the experts in running md simulations we just create the tools and work together with people who are experts in this and, and we have in vienna some excellent groups for that for instance the, the guys who are co-developing gromax chris ostenbring is one of these for instance uh, but it's it's absolutely possible and and we can we also ran uh, so sharon did this uh, dynamic uh, simulations with several ligands because sometimes you have several ligands in the binding pocket you know a, a positive understanding modulator plus the original biological ligand and that is the question how they interfere with each other so in theory it should be possible once you have your md simulations parameterized well that it can also handle the dna and i think this is not really an issue it's it's I would say a real good tool to do this because you can look at the ligands, you can look at the DNA, you can look at the protein, you can look how there is a disruption of interactions. Absolutely. I have a technical question. First of all, uh, this fantastic evolution of ligand scouts. So I'm a user of ligand scout for many, many years, and this is something really fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. So, Thanks. Um, just uh, technically, as far as I understand, uh, um, all these uh, grid-based uh, uh, surfaces actually <clears throat> uh, resulted from molecular dynamic simulations. You didn't use special probes like in molecular interaction fields. No, 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 no. We don't yeah. use probes. We just use this heuristic function where we basically we take the pharmacophore definitions of ligand scout and put them on each point as this would be a ligand atom. And then we look, can there be an interaction or not using this generalized Bell function? Mm -hmm. That's all. It, it's much faster than then, then calculating this feels like like uh, like the original grid of, of Peter Goodfriend. But how long molecular dynamic uh, trajectory must be actually? This depends on the system, but, and we do repeat. But uh, so you you have you have uh, some sort of let's say advisable, you know, this microsecond, so how nanosecond, so whatever, whatever. I don't have advice. This is something for MD MD experts. <laughs> okay, uh, Artem, what do you think? How many time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, the, the, so you, what you can do is you can run extremely long, long simulations, and then you can sample. Really. So. Okay. Sorry. So let's stop here. Discussion now. I'm sorry. So we thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.